Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to welcome you all this afternoon to the discussion on the book titled Crunch Time, Narendra Modi's National Security Crisis by Professor Sriram Cholia. The book offers an insight into Prime Minister Narendra Modi's style of crisis management, the role of his key advisors and his team in weighing risks and benefits towards India's national security policy. The book looks into how states Elites in the world have evaluated Prime Minister Modi's crisis management response behavior and correspondingly reassessed their lenses and policy options towards India. <coughs> I take this opportunity to welcome our distinguished guests uh, who have graciously accepted our invitation to join us today. I will briefly outline the program that we have for this afternoon. Ambassador Vijay Thakur Singh, Director General Indian Council of World Affairs, will give the welcome remarks, which will be followed by opening remarks by the chair, which is Ambassador Ashok Sajanhar. Thereafter, Dr. Sriram Cholia, the author of the book, will introduce the book. After this, the discussants will give their respective remarks, which would be followed by a brief question and answer session. The discussants for this afternoon are Dr. Harinda Sikon and Lieutenant General A.K. Singh. May I request Ambassador Vijay Thakur Singh, DGICWA, to kindly give her welcome remarks. <coughs> Good afternoon. I warmly welcome Ambassador Ashok Sajjan Har, Lieutenant General A.K. Singh, uh, Dr. Harinder Sekhon, and most of all, Dr. Sri Ram Cholia, author of the book, Crunch time, Narendra Modi's national security crisis. I also take this opportunity to welcome all our distinguished guests who have joined us today. This year we are celebrating 75 years of India's independence and in the last 75 years, India has faced unprecedented challenges to its national security. Protecting the nation's uh, integrity as well as uh, uh, sovereignty against a range of threats and pressures emanating from outside and ensuring a secure and stable India that can guarantee safety and prosperity of its people has been the underlying principle of India's national security policy. India is mindful of the uncertain geopolitical environment, threats of transnational terrorism, and our troubled neighborhood. Towards the west and north, we have unsettled borders with nuclear weapon states. And to the south, we have the Indian Ocean, which is becoming a theater for strategic rivalry. Moreover, India's security challenges have multiplied with new patterns of security threats emerging in both the conventional as well as the non-traditional uh, areas of security. There is thus a need for a comprehensive approach while formulating <coughs> India's response to various national threats to its security. Dr. Sriram Cholia's book provides an insightful understanding of India's national security policy under Prime Minister Modi. The book weaves a narrative that combines two interrelated fields of diplomacy and of defense to show how India has addressed challenges to its national security in the last eight years. The author mm -hmm. rightly states that Prime Minister Modi has underscored the fact that worldwide the very nature of warfare is changing and India cannot afford to think in pieces or in fragmented ways. PM, Prime Minister Modi has therefore focused on building an integrated approach to better respond to emerging threats. He has brought structural changes to India's strategic planning and outlook. The book also explains why leadership is most critical factor in determining how a country tackles persistent threats from external adversaries. The book lays out the geographical context of India's challenging neighborhood and a, in a, and a fast altering global order within which Prime Minister Modi has to often deal with challenges. Prime Minister Modi has brought India to respond to situations deftly <coughs> using smart diplomacy tools to ensure that India's view is understood by its friends and uh, its partners across the world. Prime Minister Modi has utilized opportunities thrown by new or persistent challenges 
to either strengthen ties with the external partners, as was the case during the pandemic, or to undertake decisive security measures, as was the case in Uri or Balakot strikes. India is a rising power and has secured a place in international affairs as a stable, prosperous, and a democratic nation. The world is also witnessing the rise of a nation that is unafraid to articulate its interests and its positions. At a time when the world order is intensely polarized, India remains one of the few nations which can engage with G7, G20, BRICS in a seamless way and contribute positively to global governance challenges. Today, <coughs> New Delhi plays a role in providing solutions to global problems. We look forward to discussions on this very timely book. Thank you so much. Friends, Ambassador Vijay Thakur Singh, Director General ICWA, the author of the book, Professor Sri Ram Cholia, the two eminent discuss discussants, Dr. Harinder Sikhon and uh, Lieutenant General A.K. Singh, and all uh, participants to the book discussion today. A very warm welcome to you. First of all, my compliments to the ICWA for organizing this uh, book discussion. As uh, uh, Ambassador Vijay Thakur Singh has stated, this is a very important book. This is a very important issue of national security. And I'm delighted that uh, we have the opportunity of uh, speaking about this book. And uh, I would also like to thank you, Madam Director General, for inviting me to chair the session today. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we have two eminent uh, discussants also. We'll come to them, we'll come to the author also. But before that, uh, I would like to make a few broad general remarks and then invite uh, the author, Professor Cholia, to, uh, to uh, let us know about uh, the construct, the structure of the book, and uh, the main points that he has brought out. Uh, first point that I would like to make is that this is an extremely important and relevant addition to the literature that is available on this very important subject of national security. Uh, this, uh, it is not only the subject of the idea of national security that Professor Cholia is uh, focused on, but also he brings in uh, uh, very significant uh, nuances and uh, aspects of foreign policy and diplomacy. Because uh, with national security, what we understand is the hard security at the borders. But when uh, Professor Cholia speaks about uh, how to deal with our two hostile neighbors, then it is not only military hardware that he's talking about. It's not only intelligence that he's talking about. He's also talking about other elements of uh, uh, coalition making, how to uh, have uh, the economic uh, uh, impact uh, on uh, uh, our neighbors and how to, uh, how to bring together other partners to bring pressure on these uh, countries. So it is uh, a much broader theme and a much broader subject uh, than just uh, national security. The other p is that uh, possibly this is for the first time that we have uh, some major national security crises and challenges that have been put together over a given period of time. Otherwise, so far what we have observed is uh, that uh, there have been uh, isolated uh, incidents, isolated uh, 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 battles or uh, uh, conflicts that have been uh, analyzed, but uh, they have been done in a very ad hoc manner. They have never really been brought together uh, in uh, 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 together as a whole. But here in this, uh, we have seen that these are not episodic events uh, that are being uh, discussed, that are being considered, but it is in terms of the policy framework that has been created that uh, Professor Cholia is uh, uh, focused on. Uh, as uh, uh, has been uh, uh, mentioned briefly, there are four major crises that uh, Professor Cholia has identified which have occurred over the last eight years of uh, Prime Minister Modi's uh, tenure. Starting with uh, the first one, uh, which was the Uri attack in September 2016, 
I think before that, it might also be useful to remember that uh, Prime Minister Modi had gone out of his way to reach out to our countries. He had launched the neighborhood first policy right from the first day that uh, he uh, took office. Uh, his uh, tenure commenced on the 26th of May 2014 by inviting all the leaders of the SARC countries as also the Prime Minister of Mauritius. And then in the second tenure, he invited the leaders of the BIMSTEC countries plus uh, Mauritius, plus uh, I think the president of Kyrgyzstan who at that time was holding the chair of Central Asia. So he tried, uh, he wanted to reach out to all these neighboring countries, but, uh, and also as far as uh, China is concerned. But obviously these uh, uh, initiatives did not result uh, in any uh, positive uh, outcomes uh, as far as Pakistan is concerned, it happened uh, much quicker. In 2016, September, we had the Uri attack, and uh, that was uh, responded to by the surgical strikes uh, as uh, they have come to be known. Now, of course, it was mentioned that such uh, responses had taken place in the past also, but maybe they had uh, happened in a much uh, more muted manner and not in the manner in which uh, it was done under the current uh, circumstances. I think in a manner of speaking, it is also instructive and illustrative that this happened because, uh, uh, because uh, I think it was necessary for a message to go out, very clear message to go out uh, both to the adversaries as also to the other uh, uh, players in the neighborhood that India takes its uh, national security very seriously and would not brook any uh, uh, attack as far as this is concerned. The second, of course, we have the Doklam crisis in uh, 2017, which starts in June. For 73 days, there is an eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball confrontation. There is a face-off. And that also uh, gets uh, resolved when both the sides simultaneously withdraw their troops. And here I think what is again illustrative and what Professor Cholia brings out uh, very clearly is that it is uh, some happening not on Indian territory. It is happening on the territory of a small neighbor. And here also India is uh, willing to move to protect its own uh, security interests because if whatever the road was to be built, if that had been built, it would have had uh, a very adver uh, adverse implications as far as India's security interests, is con uh, interests are concerned. So notwithstanding the invectives, the uh, insulting comments uh, uh, coming from the other side, India maintained its uh, calm and said that the matter would be resolved through diplomacy and dialogue through talks and that is how it was done. Uh, the third, of course, is the Pulwama attack in uh, February 2019 which results in the Balakot uh, strike. And the last one is uh, uh, the Galwan uh, attack, uh, that uh, the conflict that takes place, the uh, uh, tension that erupts uh, in April of 2020. And that also uh, Professor Cholia has gone into in great detail and depth. I will not go into much detail. I will leave it to the author to say what he says. But the point that I want to make as far as these four uh, uh, crises that have been identified by Professor Cholia is that number one, as far as China is concerned, it came, it was something quite unanticipated and unexpected because both the countries had been dealing with the line of actual control with the situation on the two sides according to the agreements that had been signed between the two countries in 1993 and 1996, which meant that neither of the countries was required to bring uh, the forces close to the borders. And this is what Professor Cholia brings out that notwithstanding the fact that it is uh, an, a totally unanticipated situation, the speed, the manner in which India was able to put in its troops is something quite remarkable and it uh, very uh, clearly demonstrates the strong leadership uh, that uh, Prime Minister Modi has uh, displayed as far as uh, this, uh, as far as the issue of uh, national security is concerned. I think uh, the, uh, 
the fact that India has stuck to its position both with Pakistan that uh, there will be no talks, there will be no normalization of relations unless there is a stop to terrorist actions from the other side. And as far as China is concerned, that unless there is a resolution of the situation on the border, we will not have uh, business as usual, which the Chinese have been demanding. I think this is uh, a very, uh, uh, sends out a very strong and a very clear message that India is, uh, will not allow any compromise as far as its uh, national security is concerned. I think what uh, uh, Professor Cholia brings out very clearly is that in all dealing with all these uh, national security issues, the leadership under President, uh, Prime Minister Modi has uh, come up with uh, very creative and out of the box responses. Uh, these uh, situations have been uh, very difficult, they have been very different, but yet the manner in which we have responded, in which India has responded, has uh, been uh, quite, uh, uh, quite remarkable. So, and uh, this also is uh, something that has been brought out that uh, India reaches out to its neighbors to protect uh, its uh, security in its uh, uh, periphery, in its uh, vicinity, in its neighborhood. If you look at uh, the, what, uh, uh, whether the Prime Minister's first visit uh, after taking over was to Bhutan, I think there were a number of comments that were made that Bhutan has always been a friendly country, has all, we have always had good relations. But uh, I think this, uh, the, the importance of this visit was brought out when we had the Doklam uh, crisis uh, just uh, two and a half years later. And of course, uh, the manner in which he has visited all the other neighboring countries, uh, for instance, his visit to Nepal in August 2014, was a visit by an Indian Prime Minister after 17 years. And now we see that so far in this period, the Prime Minister has visited uh, uh, Nepal already for uh, uh, five times. And similarly is the case uh, with uh, the other countries, uh, just one example of Sri Lanka where we see so much of turmoil these days, that when he visited there in March of 2015, it was the first bilateral visit after 33 years. And today we have seen how often the Prime Minister has visited. So I will not uh, uh, spend uh, more time. I will leave it now to the author to speak about the book as to how over the last eight years we have seen the transformation of India from a so-called uh, soft state moving on to acquire different uh, dimensions and different aspects of a hard state. Uh, this is something that is uh, brought out uh, very clearly. And uh, going forward, of course, this will stand India in uh, uh, good stead uh, uh, because it becomes, sends out a very clear message that India is very serious as far as protection of its uh, national security in all its uh, multifarious aspects is concerned. With these uh, few words, uh, let me once again Welcome each and every one of you, and now invite uh, Dr. Sriram Cholia. He is a professor and dean at uh, Jindal School of International Affairs at the OP Jindal University. He has a number of books also to his uh, credit. He is, I'm sure, not uh, a stranger as far as this audience is concerned. So, Sriram, you have the floor. Namaste, uh, greetings. Uh, thank you, DG uh, ICWA Ambassador Vijay Thakur Singh, and uh, all the distinguished uh, um, discussants and chair, um, Ambassador Sajin Har. I think um, ICWA is, you know, part of the history of the evolution of India's uh, foreign policy and strategic culture. So, to be hosted here uh, for my new book uh, is, in many ways, the culmination of this campaign uh, since it's come out a couple of months ago, and uh, something that's most memorable and. I've been um, hosted once before here uh, for my previous book on Trump and emerging powers in 2019. So uh, it's really a great honor. Um, I'll come straight to the point about why I wrote this and what are the uh, central uh, formulations of this book. 
the title, as you can see, it's about uh, moments of crisis when uh, you have to make quick decision and uh, time is short. And there's immense pressure on your uh, riding on whatever you do and high level of risk involved in decision making. That's crunch time. And um, as Chair Ambassador Sajinar was saying, there's been no shortage of uh, crises and crunch times uh, in the last eight years. I think uh, Honorable Prime Minister would have wanted um, more peaceful neighborhood, but uh, he was not um, allowed to have one. So the dharma of the state is to respond, uh, to protect its people and its territory when it's under attack and uh, when it is under threat. And that's exactly what he has done, uh, leading from the front, and that's why uh, you have him in um, um, camouflage fatigues. This is a BSF uh, outfit. Um, and you know, uh, many of you would be familiar that every year on the important festival of Diwali, uh, Prime Minister spends uh, with the troops on the uh, front lines. So it's meant to uh, create a a sense of uh, valorization of the armed forces and to recognize their importance in the, in the country, in defending the country, and also uh, to give a moral booster to the, fo to the, to the troops uh, because they are uh, handling two very, very ferocious adversaries, uh, especially on the Northern Front. Um, so what I'm trying to say here is that um, there is a bigger thing, it's not just about strategy or about how he has dealt with them, how he has responded, all of that, you will get a lot of details uh, in each of the chapters about each of the crises. But the bigger point is that there has been a shift in the national identity. And sometimes, because we are so caught up in the contemporary news cycle, uh, every day, you know, some incident or the other keeps happening in Kashmir Valley or along the line of actual control or in the uh, Indian Ocean and beyond, um, that we probably don't absorb the shifts or don't have the time to, uh, sit, uh, to step back from the trees and look at the full forest. So that's what I've tried to do here. And um, using the examples of these four crisis episodes with Pakistan and China to uh, talk about some major shifts. The number one, the big shift is the shift in national identity. And, um, this book is dedicated to India, which is becoming Bharat. And what I'm trying to say here is that we had um, a national identity that was not necessarily always pacifist or passive. We have had in our history and our tradition a long um, line of martial values, heroism, valor, and uh, actually statecraft, and uh, an interest in using force to deter or to defeat or subjugate your adversaries. So this uh, strain of thought has existed in Indian history and uh, in our great uh, strategic works, going back to Kautilya and Kamandaka and uh, Shukra, and um, even uh, in practice, the, we have had so many interstate uh, systems and rivalries uh, defining every era. You take up any book of Indian history and it's defined by these major battles and, uh, uh, and, 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 um, and tussles for power. And uh, in many cases, even a uh, ruthless use of force and power to uh, deal with your enemies. How to deal with your enemies? This is a very fundamental thing that uh, Indians have in our DNA. But uh, over time, um, we have emphasized more of the Pacific side of it. You know, the Ashoka and Buddha and Mahatma Gandhi, and of course, um, there's no question that this strain exists, but so also does uh, the strain of a Shivaji Maharaj or a Maharana Pratap or of a Tipu Sultan. So what I'm trying to say is that there is that part of our identity that needs to be reclaimed. And um, Lieutenant Lake Singh is here, a very distinguished uh, soldier and commander, and he's also been talking about the need to recognize the importance for hard power in um, uh, determining a, a nation's destiny. And we cannot um, downplay or sideline it, especially when we're dealing with these kind of um, extremely ferocious adversaries. Um, this, so how does India become Bharat? What I mean by Bharat is this. You know, I want you all to read it, please, and then uh, form a judgment. Uh, it's too short uh, a time for me to explain. But what I'm essentially saying is that we have had that gene for uh, power politics. 
Uh, those of you who have read Dr. S. Jayashankar, our external affairs minister's book, India Way, he talks a lot about that, right? That we have had this in our, um, in our um, makeup all the, all the while. And my argument in this book is that in the Modi era, we have become more comfortable playing power politics. We were queasy about power in earlier eras. Now we've become more comfortable. Uh, and that shows in the way we have dealt with our responses and also the pressure we have applied or the countervailing pressure we have applied whenever we, we've been attacked by China and Pakistan in the last uh, eight years. The second point is the shift in strategic culture. This is a work in make, uh, progress and it's not complete yet. But this shift that Ambassador um, uh, Sajinar already mentioned from a soft state to uh, if not a hard state, I, I say this is a more assertive state today than it was before 2014. And the contrast I give is the first case study actually is before the Modi era, which is of the 26-11 attacks in Mumbai and the failure of the Indian state to respond ad adequately and appropriately to that. Um, so what is the shift in strategic culture? I mean, I, I do look at the debate on strategic culture in the book, uh, so I invite you all to read it. It's um, your view of the world. Um, you know, it's an ontological question. It's also your view of what kind of adversaries you have, your assessment of the adversaries, and your views about and assumptions and beliefs and values about the utility of the use of force against adversaries, how much force to apply, uh, what deg uh, at what degree you draw your dread lines, and also a grand strategy. All these go into making a strategic culture. So there, there's a long debate. Uh, those of you who are into this um, field, especially security studies, there's a long debate in India about uh, whether we have a, st a strategic culture, and whether it is uh, passive or assertive, uh, or whether it is defeatist or, uh, or, or, uh, or proactive. So uh, my point here is there is a shift. And through the case studies, I'm saying that, one, we are no longer a soft state. Two, we are a lot more proactive today in deterring adversaries than we were in earlier periods. Um, and this is not only because of the leadership of the prime minister and the will and the, um, you know, his nationalistic approach to dealing with threats, but also because uh, there is a shift in the state-society relationship. And I'm arguing that the uh, younger people are more nationalistic. The expectations of the Indian society about how the state should perform its dharma vis-a-vis -vis the foreign adversaries have also shifted. Um, and I talk about audience costs, belligerence benefits, uh, lots of concepts uh, thrown into this book, and I invite you to read it. Um, the third is, of course, the reorganization of the entire defense and the national security apparatus. Uh, important structural reforms that had been pending for <coughs> half a century or longer have been implemented. Chief of Defense Staff is, of course, the crowning achievement of the Modi era of the first two terms. Uh, but I talk about many other uh, you know, shifts and um, structural changes and reorganizations. The, um, Ambassador Sajina was talking about um, using um, surprise and using um, uh, innovative means to deter adversary. So special forces, for example, General Singh will attest to this. We have had special forces capabilities, but we have built a lot more of these in recent years. And uh, they are able to really turn the tables on our two adversaries and make them rethink about challenging India. Um, so these three, uh, and I talk about also, you know, for example, our border roads, our infrastructure, undeterred by, for example, by Chinese coercion, we are willing to go ahead and continue to strengthen our side of the LAC. Um, and this is something that the Chinese probably thought that we are going to buckle under the pressure of the crises that they have created through their um, unilateral moves at the um, disputed borders. But instead, we actually double down on this strategy. And you will, you, you know, those of you who are following just the news, every couple of months or so, a new strategic road or a tunnel or a bridge or a highway is being built for uh, our forces to be able to respond faster and more effectively to the, you know, massing of 60,000 or more troops by the Chinese in unprecedented form all across the line of actual control. So a lot of tactical and operational shifts have also happened. I talked about a lot of operations in this book. I talk about an operation nation and how India you know, is quite capable of these things and uh, has really shown a different side of itself 
to the adversaries. Um, I leave you with a couple of questions. One, I do raise this point. There has been a criticism of the Modi uh, government that it's looking for confrontation and it wants to escalate. And this, um, some have said that, you know, um, some have even criticized Prime Minister as a warmonger. And I debunk most of these myths and I actually argue that he's actually more like a peace through strength uh, type of uh, vision for national security. And um, what he's trying to establish is deterrence and not look for war. In fact, in all the crisis episodes, the um, responses have been quite proportionate. And we have tried to control the escalatory metrics so that it does not go out of our hands. And uh, it doesn't um, fall into the, uh, into the adversary's hands. So those kinds of things, um, I invite you, especially those of you who are into security and defense studies, you will, uh, I'm sure, enjoy these parts. Security first doctrine of uh, our national security advisor, Ajit Doval, um, offensive defense, how is the difference from defensive defense? I've covered all of it, but um, shortage of time. Uh, last point, coalitions for national security. This is another aspect that I argue, and it's debatable, has shifted from earlier eras. Our foreign policy is more uh, predicated on um, how it can boost and enhance national security. As you know, in many parts of the world, there is a divide between um, uh, military establishment and civilians on these kind of questions. For example, in the US, the classic case, the State Department has a different view on how to deal with the country as opposed to Defense Department. They often have internal disagreements. Um, here, what I'm arguing is that we have actually put a whole of government approach, which is of course a signature uh, policy idea of uh, our prime minister, where um, diplomacy has been harnessed for national security. And uh, our external affairs minister, Dr. Jay Shankar, actually personifies it. Because the way he has dealt with the Chinese, especially in the most recent crisis, which is still ongoing since uh, March, April 2020, is he's essentially saying, and the Chinese often said, let's move ahead. Let's put the border dispute in its place and carry on with the rest of the relationship. And we are saying, you first respect our sovereignty and territorial integrity, and then we'll think about the rest of the relationship. So it's a very different India from earlier periods. And uh, um, I talk about, I contrast it to an earlier era when uh, Chinese incursions were being talked about as mere acme on the face, right? From there, we have reached a point where we are saying that, um, that it's security first. So what does all this lead to? I think uh, this is a bigger question. India is changing, I'm saying. And India is becoming Bharat, and it's a transformation. Uh, a lot of young energy is involved. I'm so happy to see young people in the audience here. And uh, my argument is that this quest for national security is an eternal one. And my own reading is the international situation is getting more and more conflictual and less and less cooperative. And uh, we are going to see more crises. Uh, and in, in many ways, the response matrices that have, we have seen in the last eight years are the template for us to uh, deal with future crises, both with China and with Pakistan. So, um, yeah, so there's a lot more in the book. It's 288 pages, so please read it, and uh, I'm happy to engage with you. I'll just conclude with a Sanskrit shloka that uh, Honorable Prime Minister tweeted when the Rafael jets landed in India. Uh, you will re recall that a few weeks after the Galwan clash with the Chinese, uh, we fast-forwarded the delivery from France of the Rafael um, combat aircraft. And uh, he tweeted, Rashtra Raksha Samam Punyam, Rashtra Raksha Samam Vratam, Rashtra Raksha Samam Yagye, Drishto Naivacha Naivacha. Which means there is no greater uh, act of uh, a piety than national security. There is no greater act of ritual or prayer or religion than national security. And there's in, can, there can never be. National security, national security is the highest uh, uh, purpose of a state and even of a society. All of us are stakeholders in it. So crunch time, I've actually written it to energize uh, the base and young people especially, uh, and all, of course, the strategic elites to think about this shift in the, national, uh, in the strategic culture and where we are going. And uh, I believe it's a positive uh, change, uh, but something that needs to carry on and institutionalize. Um, I've often been asked what happens after Modi. I said, I'll worry about it maybe after 2029 or something. I'm not worried about it right now. But 
yes, we need to institutionalize these changes. And uh, it's on, uh, you know, it rides on our shoulders to carry forward this thing. I mean, with this shift towards an assertive strategic culture, willingness to sacrifice, willingness to take risks, and willingness to, um, to be more heroic. Uh, Jan Singh has been talking about how we are in a post-heroic era where uh, people don't forgive the loss of even a single Jawan and think that it's a failure. But then, at, at great sacrifices only, as soldiers would tell you, can a uh, nation be secured? And I think uh, we have leadership from the top that is uh, pushing that kind of a vision that uh, security is not to be compromised. And of course, you can argue uh, whether we've been able to push back the Chinese from all the points since 2020. It's work in progress. There are many uh, crises that are going to recur and come back. So we need to buckle up and be prepared for this arduous struggle to defend the nation. Thank you very much. I just make two comments on what you have said. One, I think, you know, when you make the point that uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi is, uh, uh, is uh, projected as a warmonger, I don't think anything could be further from the truth. I tend to agree with you what you have said, because uh, right from the beginning of his tenure, as I mentioned, he had uh, tried to reach out to the neighborhood because, and in all his uh, remarks and uh, in all his statements, whether it was at the United Nations in September 2014 when he goes to first deliver his talk at the UNGA, he said uh, a country's uh, destiny is linked to its neighborhood, and that is why we would like to, uh, uh, to uh, have the best of relations with our neighbors. And you would recall that, uh, you know, he traveled to uh, Islamabad and uh, uh, Rai Wind on the 25th of December 2015. Lahore, yes. Lahore Rai Wind, etc. You know, to the uh, uh, old uh, uh, property of uh, Nawaz Sharif at that time to participate in his granddaughter's wedding also. And I think it was, uh, he was the only prime minister who could have taken this uh, bold initiative to on way from Kabul back to India to drop in at, uh, in uh, Pakistan. So this was again, to reach out uh, so that uh, peace could be given a chance rather than uh, you know, engage in warmongering. And even after Pathan Court happened on the 1st of January of 2016, still uh, 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 you know, we continue to engage with Pakistan. I think the uh, really uh, the fissure, the absolute, the break point came at, uh, in, uh, with Pulwama in February of uh, 2019. And after that, uh, what our uh, position has been that uh, uh, until there is terrorism emanating from the other side, there can be no, con no talks. And I think similarly, as far as uh, China is concerned, you know, we had uh, all these uh, summit meetings in September 2014. We had the visit of Xi Jinping coming to India. At that time also, there was an incursion across our borders. We tried to resolve it. It was resolved. We went forward, there was a good uh, uh, informal summit uh, in the now infamous uh, Wuhan in April 20, 2018, if my memory serves me correctly. And then again an informal summit in Mamallapuram in October of 2019. So I think from our side, from India, from Prime Minister Modi, all efforts have been made to reach out to these uh, two hostile neighbors and it was only after April 2020, when you had 50, 60,000 uh, troops amassing, totally violative of the bilateral agreements that had been signed between the two countries, that you really came uh, to this uh, face off when, as you mentioned, that you know, unless there is peace and tranquility and uh, uh, pre April uh, uh, situation, there can be no uh, normal bus uh, business ties and relations with China. So with these words, uh, let me now invite uh, the first discussant according to the program that we have, Dr. Harinder Sikhon. Uh, she's a strategic and foreign policy analyst. I know she's worked uh, earlier with uh, Vivekananda International Foundation, also with uh, ORF. So you have the floor and 10 minutes. In fact, I'll be briefer than that. Okay, okay. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Professor Cholia, and to the ICWA for giving me this opportunity to come. 
uh, and be here this afternoon. I've been through the book, and I really must compliment you. I think I've already done that in person. Uh, extremely well written, well researched, and an excellent flow of uh, the language. Uh, it just flows uh, beautifully, and these dry uh, four episodes, which can be very, very dry events in India's uh, foreign policy, I think they come to life with the kind of language, Professor Choli, I'm not trying to sell his book, but those are facts. Uh, he's also very, very correct in his assessment about the new vigor that we witness in uh, Prime Minister Modi's uh, foreign policy. Uh, there's a certain amount of decisiveness. There is a quickness of uh, action responding to the crises and to the challenges. And I think he's uh, you know, been pretty realistic in his book while he talks about the positives which we have witnessed in recent years uh, since 2014 and more recent during the second um, uh, government of uh, Prime Minister Modi. But he's equally realistic in uh, assessing the challenges and uh, what uh, Ambassador Sajjan Hal just spoke about. Uh, Prime Minister Modi uh, making that trip to Pakistan and participating in the wedding of uh, Nawaz Sharif's uh, daughter, uh, granddaughter. Uh, I think instances like this, uh, it's, a ch uh, it's a chance which uh, Prime Minister Modi took. And uh, the fallout, uh, you know, the verdict is still there because there were people who, uh, detractors who felt that uh, this there was a certain amount of na naivety in uh, the conduct of foreign policy, whereas some see it as an outreach and in a, in a very positive direction. And since it was followed soon by the Pathan Court incident, uh, I think uh, there was a, a lot of uh, media pressure on the kind of foreign policy challenges <coughs> and the kind of conduct of foreign policy by the present, uh, by the Modi government. So I would s say that, uh, you know, and also Professor Cholia has uh, talked about, uh, you know, he, when he was making his remarks, uh, he has talked about uh, you know, uh, the foreign policy being a work in progress. The challenge r challenges will continue to come, and I think as, uh, uh, and this will also demand a certain amount of change in uh, our responses and in our foreign policy. We'll have to uh, devise it uh, according to the times. And when we are talking about a work in progress, you know, I uh, actually go back uh, and I think that we really need to take in a little bit of history. And one of the most decisive foreign policy acts was 1971. This really put us, you know, it gave us the confidence. We were able to uh, kind of, um, you know, get over the drubbing of 1962. And it was, uh, you know, at the height of the Cold War, what we did in 1971 is truly remarkable. So I think there have been instances even in the past where leaders have taken decision, and I think Shri Ram does talk about, mentions Mrs. Gandhi in his book towards the end. Uh, so there is a realization. I think he's practical and he gives credit where it is due. So it is a work in progress, and we need to look at 1971, and also, you know, to look at India's current confident emergence, you know, to India's emergence as a very confident nation, where we are, you know, invited as a special invitee to the G7. We are there in G20. We aspire to, you know, uh, be a P5, you know, uh, to be a permanent member of the Security Council. But these are all works in uh, progress. And I think what has really led to this current uh, reality are two other instances. One would be the economic opening up of India, 1991, the reforms of 1991. And then also the nuclear deal of 2007. I think that is what, where the more recent, I think you were in the US at that time, and the real growth, you know, the India story uh, post Cold War really begins from the nuclear deal because, uh, you know, I think the way the United States threw its weight behind India and lobbied for India and to get that NSG waiver. I think these are instances, so there have been 
uh, instances in India's history, in India's foreign policy, where we have shown a certain amount of decisiveness. And these have all contributed together in a significant manner to India's rise. And in this, I think, apart from the hard power, is also the soft, the role of the Indian diaspora, you know, which has uh, further played the India story. And uh, they rally, they uh, petition the government, and so the, you know. So I think it's it's in it's a continuum uh, where we are today, and it'll continue to progress in a similar manner. Uh, we do have a very high sense of nationalism. We are proud of our uh, identity. We are proud of our Indianness. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, here uh, I also see a certain amount of, I mean, if I think you and I will have a separate discussion on this. Uh, it really, I mean, uh, there's a debate, and I do think about it often. Uh, I, uh, is there a commonality between non-alignment and multi-alignment? How are they different? You know, we have been acting in our self-interest when we emerged from colonialism. We thought that what we adopted our foreign policy at that time was the right uh, path to embark on, uh, you know, to be non-aligned, but, uh, you know, and it gave us a certain amount of stature, it gave us a certain amount of leverage in international relations at that time. And today, when we say that we are multi-aligned in a multipolar world, uh, I think we are still acting in our own interest, in our own strategic interests. So I think there is a common thread which binds our foreign and security uh, policy. Uh, also, you know, there was a great deal of stress on uh, self-reliance at that time. In the 60s, in the 70s, uh, India wanted to be self-reliant. Uh, we sought technology. We wanted to modernize. We wanted to industrialize. We followed the Soviet pattern of that five-year, you know, the five-year plans of uh, getting technology of uh, economic model, uh, you know, which may not have worked, which may have seemed right at that time. But uh, I think self-reliance is what the present dispensation seeks to achieve through Atmanirbhar Bharat. Uh, I think the aims are the same. Uh, it's just that there is, the media probably is uh, more savvy. We have 24-7 TV channels. So, um, you know, and our aim continue, aims continue to remain the uh, same. And to emerge as a strong power, I think we have to have both military and economic power. And uh, India, apart from it, trying to achieve uh, hard power, we also, you know, flaunt uh, our soft power capabilities. And more recently, uh, the government and the prime minister have been talking about uh, vaccine diplomacy. It's one of the high points of the COVID, uh, you know, India's contribution to global vaccines and uh, rushing vaccine supplies to our neighborhood and to the other countries. I think it's something which is, you know, designed to make an impact. And the India story, you know, as time goes by and as new challenges come, the government of the day needs to devise, and they continue to devise uh, uh, policy responses. And, um, you know, and this, I think, feeds into your point of peace through strength. Uh, so, you know, so we have inherent core strengths, our scientific rigor. I think we invested in the IITs and all. Uh, our techies who have contributed to the great success in Silicon Valley, uh, but unfortunately, they've not been utilized over here. So these challenges is something which will continue to uh, take up a lot of our time and energies. Uh, it's nice to see youth over here, but I think um, at the same time, uh, we really need to invest more in our youth. And we need to have a proper policy, you know, not a knee-jerk announcement. And I was in the National Security Council for two years in 2003 and 2004. And I find that what debates were happening there at that time still continue to happen today. I mean, despite 2018, the complete overhaul and revamp of our national security strategy. And uh, so it's driven a lot by uh, the personality of uh, the NSA, uh, you know, uh, who's very, very active, totally committed because he is an intelligence man. And I think he's totally committed and he literally breeds, eats, dreams national security. But I think we really need to 
create a more nurturing ad, uh, environment for these, uh, for our, uh, not only for our youth, but also to create the right environment for people to flourish. Uh, you know, the scientists, we've been talking about investing in our science, uh, being uh, independent and self-reliant when it comes to uh, technology. So we do have the manpower, we <coughs> do have uh, certain centers of excellence, but there is no such thing as a wide policy. So I think we continue to remain a work in progress. We will be for some time, but the need of the hour is to stop procrastinating because the challenges are very real. We are, the world is in a state of flux and we really need to move from here and institutionalize what we talk about. And uh, maybe in your next book, <laughs> you will <laughs> go to that. And I'm not going to touch on the defense and all. I think I'll leave that for General A.K. Singh. Thank you so much. It was, uh, really the watershed moment. It was uh, uh, in terms of uh, relations between India and the United States, it was a very significant uh, moment. But I think the genesis of that really goes back to the 1998 uh, uh, nuclear tests. So, you know, without uh, having that on board, uh, this would not have happened. And also, I think as we go, f as we went forward, 2008, there was uh, this heavy lifting by the United States, but it is uh, more uh, recently that we have engaged in uh, such uh, coalitions. You did mention about G7, but I think we also have now the Quad that has come into position, which is, uh, uh, leveraging our uh, connections, our uh, relations with other partners. And tomorrow we are going to have the first uh, virtual meeting of uh, I2U2. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is also a measure of the confidence with which uh, India looks at the world and uh, how it can play a much more uh, meaningful and an assertive role which we have seen. And as uh, Professor Cholia has discussed that, what happened in 2008, and if you compare that to today, I think you will see a sea change in the thinking and in the perspectives. Uh, uh, now I have a pleasure in inviting uh, Lieutenant A.K. Singh, PVSM, AVSM, SM, VSM, retired. He is the former Lieutenant Governor of the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, ex-General Officer Commanding in Chief, uh, Southern Command. You have the floor, sir, 10 minutes. Ambassador Vijay Thakur Singh, Director General ICWA, Chair, the author, fellow discussant, and distinguished audience. Well, with a catchy title like Crunch Time and an attention drawing picture of our Prime Minister in the Commander's Kapola of the Arjun Tank, what is this book about? The main offering of this book relates to the change that came about post-2014 in the overall stratagem of national security. And when Prime Minister Modi asserted his security first vision and the doctrine of offensive defense, and that's a theme we can talk of later. This altered the strategic calculus, certainly against Pakistan, and maybe to a limited extent against China, though I would be skeptical to make that uh, decision or that statement. Through his deep understanding and knowledge of the realm of national security and strategy, Sri Ram Cholia has made a very important contribution to help us understand how this transformation has come about in India's not only India's national security policy, but in our outlook and our thinking. Well, he starts by going to the pre-Modi era and traces out how India did not respond to grave provocations. But the rot had set in quite early. I remember, most of you would remember, that when the parliament was attacked in 2001, the armed forces were mobilized for Op Parakram. And as it turns out, 
there was no strategic military objective that was defined for that mobilization. I was in military operations during that period and was moved out overnight to take over the first T-90 brigade in the desert. And we stayed there for one year. Pakistan in the first month lay open. And I dare say that uh, most of the organizations and people at the helm who mattered did not push the government strongly enough. No government is overly keen to go to war, but I think Pakistan needed a reminder that they cannot keep uh, threatening India's security and we missed a golden opportunity. I happened to meet Mr. Jaswan Singh, then I think our foreign minister, uh, during Aparakram at Pune when I was Southern Army commander and I asked him, I said, sir, what were the objectives for mobilizing us for one year? And he looked me straight in the face and he said, I am still wondering. The decision was taken that the act was so uh, hurtful and violent, the attack on parliament, the sanctum sanctorum of a democracy, that the government decided that we need to mobilize the armed forces for war. The decision whether we would go to war or not would be taken in due course after concentration. In the meantime, uh, I think the Americans got into the act. President Musharraf <coughs> made a speech very vowed that we will never again allow our land to be used. And we have seen how it has been used again and again. The resultant cold start doctrine, uh, actually the military terminology is different, but the media calls it cold start doctrine, was actually made post Parakram analysis to respond to such incident. But when Mumbai happened, we again held our hand. A large number of us within the army circle and General Rajinder is sitting here, we are colleagues in MO, stressed it adequately to the hierarchy. But I do believe that this pacifism that had got, got hold of us over many years probably also transcended a little into the armed forces. Well, how did the transformation take place? I'll just be anecdotal. Uh, I met Modi ji after his first swearing in on 4th June as Lieutenant Governor of Andaman. He gave me time. And of course, I briefed him on Andaman. But then I handed him over a handwritten note of five pages which dealt with defense. And I said, sir, my expertise lies in this field and here are issues which, uh, should, uh, which should need your attention. He says, uh, General Sahib, tell me two issues of importance. So I said, sir, first is, please uh, effect the National War Memorial. It has been in the making for too long. He says, second, I said, second, I said, the armed forces in India are not capable of integrating bottom upwards. We have tried it for the last 70 years. It requires a top down. So he looked at me, he's a patient listener, and he said, yeah, both are high on my priority. And as you see, that early in Modi 2.0, he gave effect to both of them. One is complete, the other is a work in progress. And here I must say uh, that that work in progress, uh, we are on slightly slippery ground after the unfortunate demise of our first CDS, General Rawat, and the government would do well to make haste in appointing his successor. Not only that, but to give it their full <coughs> support to make sure that this integration takes place. Sriram Cholia uh, analyzes two incidents against Pakistan, Uri and Pulwama. Now, most of you have read adequately about Uri and the surgical strikes in September 2016. Uh, what you would I would highlight only two issues. One, that it was a very calibrated and thought through action with very negligible chance of uh, it leading to escalation. 
because the aim was not to punish Pakistan. I think the aim was to convey a signal, a warning shot across the bow to say that hereafter it won't be business as usual. Unfortunately, Pakistan did not take heed and that resulted in Pulwama. And Pulwama followed by Palakot. Uh, if you, I just did a small study on escalation and crisis management between India and Pakistan. And India was careful after Pulwama. We gave them a full 10 to 12 days before we went to Balakot. Enough time for Pakistan's diplomatic, I think their foreign minister, Aziz, came to India. But they would not acknowledge that this has emanated. They kept asking for doziers. And we kept, we gave them the doziers as well. And yet they did not take heed. So India took recourse to a deep airstrike inside Pakistan at Palakot. Again, some of us went wrong in counting the terrorists we had killed. Some of us went wrong in talking of the destruction that had been wrought. That was not the aim. It was a clear signal to Pakistan that you have no place to hide if you again come and dare to uh, challenge our national security. I think the great import of both these incidents lay in the fact, and I say <clears throat> because uh, surgical strike kind of incidents or operations had been done by the Indian Army many times earlier. The import this time was that the government of the day under Prime Minister Modi took ownership of this. You see, there's a difference if the military responds across the line of control. And there's a clear difference if your top executive takes ownership and you put the ball in Pakistan's court. So the ball is clearly in Pakistan's court, also in our court. Next time, if Pakistan dares to do something like this, we better be prepared. And that onus lies on the armed forces. Against China, uh, Doklam, I think we surprised the Chinese by our diplomatic and military action. They did not expect us to be so fast in our action, especially when dealing with land which bordered a small neighboring country. We also reaffirmed our commitment to Bhutan's security. But I think where we went wrong was we took the Chinese literally um, uh, to say that things are now settled and over. The Chinese don't forget easily. And I think there was no reason for us to get surprised the way we did get surprised in Latak. Though, mind you, the response of the Indian Armed Forces was absolutely brilliant, and we stopped the Chinese where they had to be stopped. There are, um, in Latak, um, I'm aware that we have options which are called QPQ options, quid pro quo options. And all of us are um, aware that these are planned, rehearsed, and ready. The surprise for me is that why didn't we take resort to these options? Again, it takes time for the DNA to change. We finally did that when we occupied the Kalash range. <coughs> and that put the Chinese in a fix. But let me say that the story in Ladakh is not over. The Chinese are not keen to give up land that they have occupied in Depsang. They are many kilometers inside. And India is uh, very keen that we return to status quo ante if we are to move ahead. But like it happens uh, in the rest of the world, business is going on as usual. Uh, just a point about uh, the lessons learned from such episodes. I would say that there is introspection that is due amongst all of us, that when we go through such, uh, such uh, high-level uh, episodes, <clears throat> which have a great connotation on India's security, I think we need to be brutally frank 
in introspection and lessons learned, maybe not in the public domain, but certainly in the classified domain. And that needs to happen. In the, it's, it has to be a whole of government approach, including the armed forces. And people like us have been pointing out to the armed forces that we need to get our lessons right. Now, just uh, two minutes to look at the future. For the future, two major strategic shifts are warranted in our higher defense mindset from Pakistan-centric to China-centric orientation, and from subconventional to the new generation warfare. An excessive counterinsurgency and line of control focus has taken yet to be fully analyzed toll on our preparedness for our primary role. It is more than obvious that in geostrategic terms, while Pakistan may be the immediate irritant, China is the long-term challenge. But what about the nature of the contest with China? Well, China is not an irrational power, though it may be uh, a slightly erratic power. It is unlikely to spoil its ascendant role by resorting to an all-out war with India. This is very different, however, from deftly weaving force into its statecraft to aggressively pursue its interests, which they are known to do, and constrict India's geostrategic space through deft leveraging, particularly in the non-kinetic and non-contact domains. And I won't go further. Therefore, developing layered, intertwined military response options within a carefully thought through escalatory frame is something we need to attend to with dispatch. The military mind needs to stop thinking of itself only in terms of a last resort option to win wars. It must now also diligently apply itself to an even higher order skill, how to avert wars without losing faith and our national interests. Given the burgeoning economic differential with China, it is quite apparent that we will not, for the foreseeable future, be able to match the Chinese, their defense spending rupee for yuan. We need to, however, spend significantly more to at least sharpen our conventional and asymmetric capacities as optimized, as also optimized by way of defense reform and structural overall. Maybe we cannot get smarter, but we certainly need to get, uh, we cannot get smarter, but we certainly need to get smarter. Well, in conclusion, I would say that Sri Ram Cholya, with whom one has the pleasure of working academically, has done creditable work of collating evidence and presenting a lucid account of the drivers of Modiji's national security policies that has transformed India's strategic outlook to help make the country more confident and secure. Perhaps in this book, some light could have been shed, my apologies, Sriram, for mentioning this, could have been shed on repeated intelligence failures and how this is being set right. Also the fact that despite this great positivity in our national security response, we are yet to articulate a written national security strategy. This along with the fact of inadequate defense budgets is a matter of intellectual and strategic concern. To sum up, I would say, Having two hostile fronts on either flank is not a comfortable situation to live with. It's time some out-of-the-box ideas are brought to the fore. Our diplomats and strategic thinkers have their tasks cut out. Thank you. Jai Hind. Is that at least for the foreseeable future, because there is so much of... Uh, troop levels that are deployed, that the salami slicing that we say has been going on for a long time, at least yeah. that would stop for, 
uh, you know, because India is uh, very uh, alert on that on that front. The second point is uh, you did mention about how we surprised the Chinese by taking over the Kalash Heights, uh, whether it is the Magar Hill and the Gurung Hill and all the others, in August, uh, September of uh, 2020. And uh, I think when the withdrawal took place in February 2021, the manner in which the Chinese had to destroy all their infrastructure that had been built by them from finger four to finger eight, I think that also would have been yeah. very illustrative for people, not only in India, but around the world that China has been forced by its own bulldozers and JCBs to uh, d uh, destroy all its uh, hangars and all the other arrangements that it had made. And the final point, what you said very rightly, we need to spend more on defense. And I think this is a problem that has been with us, not today, not 10 years ago, but for a long, long time. And this really brings us that we have to focus much more on our economy and today, notwithstanding whatever is happening in the world, the <coughs> uncertainties, the flux, etc., India continues to be the fastest growing uh, major economy in the world. And hopefully with all the initiatives that have been uh, taken, whether it is uh, Startup India, Digital India, and so on and so forth, and Atnir Bharta that Dr. Sekhon mentioned, I think all of this will uh, help us in uh, being able to uh, put uh, more uh, 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 money in, uh, as far as defense is concerned. Now I see that we have already uh, uh, crossed the our, uh, uh, time of uh, 4.35, but if uh, with the permission of the organizers and uh, uh, Madam Director General, if we can just take a few minutes more and maybe two or three questions uh, from the floor because I think we've heard very spirited uh, presentations, both from the author as well as the discussants. So if we, uh, uh, we'll have the floor open for two or three questions, please uh, identify yourself, identify the person to whom you want to pose the question and make your questions short. I would appreciate that. So the floor is open. Yes, sir. Uh, the mic is there. Please take the mic. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, my name is General Rajinder Singh. Uh, I'm a former Director General Infantry. Uh, firstly, thank you very much. I think uh, this has been a very uh, good discussion that we have had. And I totally agree with you that under uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi's uh, tenure, India has really come of age. And I think one basic thing which has really come um, come about is that people are taking note of India. India cannot be ignored. And this has happened because, because of a number of factors which you have mentioned. And I think uh, he, he certainly deserves full credit for it. But also, uh, I think the biggest, uh, uh, I think, achievement of his has been in the field of giving tremendous amount of confidence in the security sector, particularly the armed forces, certain amount of decentralizations, taking uh, uh, actions where, uh, where it is needed. And I think all this is really uh, exemplified in a number of incidents that have taken place. But all is not good. There have been some challenges still ahead. Firstly, our modernization is absolutely at the lowest at the moment. It needs to really rise. Your Tejas aircraft will not be enough. We need to have the aircrafts like Rafale and many more of these. We need to really modernize the details. I will just leave it out. I don't think it will be proper to give it out in an open forum. But this needs to be done. Secondly, this Atma Nirbharta has to be done by clubbing it with Make in India. <coughs> and I think if we, if we do this, and if we do not ignore it, uh, uh, I think it will do us a lot of good. Um, the second point which I want to make is that your armed forces are the best in the country. Or they are probably best in the world. I have been commanding United Nations forces uh, uh, in Ethiopia and Eritrea. 
And uh, I can say with tremendous amount of confidence that we are the best. And uh, st still, uh, there is tinkering going on with our systems, like Agnipat, which I personally feel is highly unwarranted. And I'll leave it at that. But finally, I would say that arrival of Prime Minister Modi onto the scene has really uplifted the country's image. It has really given you tremendous <coughs> amount of confidence, both in economic field as also in security matters, QUAD and various other uh, institutions like G7, G20 are really cases in point. Um, I would like uh, you to comment on this. Thank you. Let's, let's take the questions first, and then I think we will. Yes. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my question to uh, Mr. Ambassador Jajan and uh, Mr. Cholia, sir, uh, that uh, many in the West have blamed uh, Rush growing Russia-China access for uh, uh, emboldening recent Moscow's uh, uh, moves. And uh, it is also a concern, uh, I guess, for uh, India. So what is your take on this? Thank you. Thank you. Any other? There are many hands going up. Uh, Maybe, yeah, one more question here and one there. That's the last. Yes, madam, you, please. Um, greetings to all of you. I am Radhika Narula, a student from Kirodimal College, University of Delhi. Sir, uh, when you were talking, uh, then you mentioned in your speech that uh, from a very cooperative uh, world, uh, the world is becoming more conflictual. So you said that more crises are happening right now, and we can predict more crises to happen in future as well. So what is your take? Like, Who is to blame because of this conflictual environment that is happening in the international politics right now? Thank you, sir. Thank you. So last question. Yeah. Thank you very much. <coughs> I'm going to stri uh, strike a discordant note, if you don't mind. <coughs> You see, many of the points you have mentioned are acceptable, not problematic, factual points. But I get the feeling we are talking before action. You don't crow about a new strategic culture. Let it deliver. Real politics has to be played through action. So. A general comment, I'll leave it at that. But I have to take exception against many of the remarks made in assessment of China, China's actions against India. I think, except General A.K. Singh's remarks, I may be wrong in recollecting, it applies to many, all the others. We cannot include China as an example of success of the new approach. After Ladakh, the kinds of things that are being said, I think, are puerile. It needs a closed-door discussion to be able to thrash it out. I am ready if it ICWA organizes. I am a student of China. The conclusions we are drawing are completely unwarranted. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this. Uh, so uh, maybe I offer the floor uh, because there are questions addressed to you, uh, Professor Cholia. Sir, I'll and take the ones on conflictual world and talking before action because it relates to the book. And I'll request General to respond to modernization, Russia, China, access. No, I think on modernization, General Rajinder Singh has agreed with him. I don't yeah. think there was a question. Yeah. Yeah. There was a comment that was made. Right. So. So since we are running out of time, I, I think I'll, let's, let's I'll quickly be respond yeah, yeah. on wha who yeah. is to blame for the shift towards a more conflictual world. You know, it's a structural problem. At least as a social scientist, that's how we view it. Um, when great power confrontation uh, increases, when multipolarity increases uh, or emerges, is bound to lead to more contestation and conflict. So starting with the war in Syria about 10 years ago, you'll see that dissent. And simultaneously, power is becoming more diffuse around the world. 
So more power centers emerge which want to assert their own interests and are unwilling to compromise. Even with India, China, um, I, I show that extensively in the book that we have, if, if he, Xi Jinping is a hyper-nationalist or a, you know, has got his hegemonic uh, intent, um, we have in Modi also a very nationalistic leader. So uh, conflict in that sense is inevitable. And the question is, how do you manage it before without leading to war, a full-scale war, which General um, A.K. Singh mentioned? So uh, emerging multipolarity, the post-Cold War era is over. What era is this one? I, want, I would like to call it emerging multipolarity era. <coughs> so in this era, there's going to be more conflict and more crisis until you find a new stable equilibrium. But it will take at least 5, 10, 15 more years before we are able to settle this. We would like to be an equal of China and the United States and become, uh, uh, as uh, Prime Minister Modi calls it, a leading power in the world. Once that goal is achieved, perhaps we may have greater equilibrium. But then there are declining powers, like Russia, that also want to continue to be seen, to, to be heard, and to be acknowledged and respected. So uh, I think uh, rise and fall of great powers eventually leads to more conflicts and, and crises. Um, are we talking before action? Sir, uh, please read 288 pages. Uh, I think maybe you haven't read it, so I request you to read it before passing a judgment about how much I'm talking in the book and uh, whether it's um, uh, justified or not. Also, the whole issue about, um, you know, that we have failed in front of China. I think this itself is a polemical thing. I have uh, two chapters on this with very great detail of empirical evidence. So this is not rhetoric, but empirical evidence. So I'd request you to please read it and then uh, resume the discussion. As far as, um, see, there is an asymmetric advantage that China has overall in military and economic terms. But theory as well as um, history shows that um, parity in capability is not a prerequisite to, uh, for a country to deter a stronger adversary. You're seeing that even today with you know, tiny Ukraine, really, really making life miserable for the Russians. So I would say that um, if we don't talk about strategic culture, we cannot will it into reality. It's a, I'm using in what we in academic terms call a constructivist argument, that you cannot see a shift unless you are able to create consensus. In fact, in this book, I talk about state-society relations and how the social approach and expectations from the state have shifted in a direction which is more proactive and assertive. So if you don't talk about it, if you don't acknowledge, if it's kept behind um, um, uh, the corridors of power and doesn't become a public discourse, then I'm afraid that the strategic culture will never shift. Strategic culture is not an elite concept. It requires a huge buy-in from the society. And that's why I wrote this book. So please read it and let's continue the debate. Sir, can I just make two okay. quick points? Okay, okay. Uh, just two quick points. Since World War II, there have been approximately 25 to 30 major conventional conflicts, but over 100 sub-conventional conflicts of the type we face in Kashmir, Northeast, etc. Now, if you club them, one could be clubbed as the most likely. Over 100 of these are happening, small, small. But the other ones, like the Russia-Ukraine war, is the most dangerous. So most countries like India, we face a dilemma. What should we prepare for? In our minds, we are quite, uh, let's say, clear that the state will try its best to avoid a full-scale war. In the 21st century, with the kind of destructive power that is available, Going to war is the least preferred option. But can you afford to neglect it? And that's the dilemma that we face, and that's what we require money for, so that we prepare not only for individual fronts, but we prepare for a two front, which is unlikely, but <coughs> could happen. And the second thing is, as far as China is concerned, for long, we have been looking at dissuasion as our operational philosophy. Dissuasion using our diplomatic uh, expertise, uh, dissuasion uh, using our socio-economic political engagement and the armed forces. We are now shifting from dissuasion to deterrence. And hopefully, that would make us stronger in confronting 
people who are more adventurous. Thank you. Harinda, would you care to say? OK. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, let me uh, first uh, try and respond to a question that we had from that side. And you spoke about uh, the increasing closeness between Russia and China and how what is the impact on uh, India? Does it have an impact on India? And I think, uh, yes, in a manner of speaking, because this has been getting, uh, uh, both the countries have been getting closer, particularly since we have seen the pressure on China growing, whether it was during the tenure of uh, uh, US President Donald Trump or also on Russia after Crimea in 2014 and after that, uh, what has been happening. And uh, the culmination of that was witnessed on the 4th of February when we saw President Putin visiting uh, Beijing for the Winter Olympics. And uh, although there is no uh, specific evidence to suggest that, but it is thought, it is felt that uh, it was, uh, uh, China had been, or at least indication had been given to China during Putin's visit that uh, the attack on Ukraine will take place after the Olympics are over. And it's, it did happen on the 24th, just after the Olympics took place. But I think the Chinese also had, would have given uh, their nod to such an action by Russia because they would have been convinced, or the Russians would have managed to convince them that uh, this would be a, sh a short operation. And that is what it was known. It was called a special military operation. But now we are in the fifth month. And I think China has also been uh, quite uh, uh, concerned in terms of how it is uh, moving, but this has uh, really brought these two countries uh, together. It is a matter of call, uh, uh, worry, it is a matter of anxiety as far as India is concerned, but that is also one of the reasons why we have been <coughs> keeping our, uh, uh, our uh, avenues open as far as Russia is concerned, both in terms of uh, uh, our uh, import of oil, it is not only uh, has uh, economic uh, significance, but also strategic significance because we want to keep our channels of communication open. So we'll have to see how things uh, develop, how things evolve. But uh, definitely it is, uh, again, something uh, that is uh, uh, developing and uh, we'll need to uh, continue to wait and uh, watch. Uh, so with this, uh, let me uh, uh, make the final concluding uh, remark. I think it's been a fascinating discussion today. Thank you uh, each and every one of, uh, uh, first of all, to the author for his presentation, to the two panelists, to the two discussants, and of course, uh, the large audience that has been here uh, patiently listening and uh, assimilating all that is being said. I second what uh, the Speakers have said that it is really good to see young people in the crowd, and uh, I didn't see any one of them nodding off, so it's, uh, that is uh, even uh, more important. But uh, the last point that I'm going to make is that it is an eminently readable book. When I started reading it, uh, it is, uh, you know, sometimes you call, you uh, pick up a book, pick up a novel, it is unputdownable, you sort of, you know, pick it up and uh, it, ha it has a momentum of its own. And that is what uh, I felt in this book of uh, Professor uh, Sriram Cholya. So once again, my felicitations to you for doing an excellent work. And uh, I'm sure all those who uh, pick it up and read it, you will not uh, regret it. You will find yourself uh, richer in uh, terms of uh, your uh, assessment of the situation in India and around the country. So once again, thank you very much uh, to the ICWA for getting uh, all of us together. And uh, now I leave it to the hosts to make the final announcement. Thank you so much, sir. I take this opportunity to express my gratitude to Ambassador Vijay Thakur Singh, Dr. Harinder Sikon, and Lieutenant General A.K. Singh for the insightful remarks. I also take this opportunity to thank Ambassador Ashok Sachinha for chairing the discussion and his insightful comments. I would now take this opportunity to thank our guests for joining us today. We look forward to welcoming you to our future events. Please join us for high tea at the foyer. Thank you so much.